Hi everyone. Quiet or I hack you. I'm not joking. Right? My name is Andre Krell and uh, I will speak to speak today because I was told I have a good accent. Alright, so what I want to discuss today are forensic investigations and uh, what we do at uh, LifeRs. So I'll walk you through some of the stories uh, that we've done here over the last three years. And I'm really thankful, OWASP, for all the support, Tom Brennan. Um, it's really great to have a local endorsement when you play on a local ground. I'm also very thankful to our marketing team and uh, Michael Nemchuk, who put the presentation to put together. Uh, and um, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for coming tonight. All right, we can skip this slide. So a little bit of an intro. I'll uh, give you a free example of APT type of attacks, like advanced persistent threat, uh, some of the tools that we use, and uh, how we gather forensic evidence, and a uh, case study that was here in New York, quite famous, uh, a pretty good study. Um, and then a little bit on the uh, life cycle of the incident response and uh, forensics. All right. So <clears throat> what do you think is a step zero when you are breached? What would you do? I'll show your resume. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Nice. What'd you do? I like that. See, he's trained. He's professional. You can see that. Step zero always, update your resume. Honestly, for the last year and a half, this guy's been in your network. You have, you, you've got bigger problems, right? You, if you're board of the directors, you better have insurance. Right? Go get a glass of water, update your resume. You know, there's good market still out there for you. Still, still good market. So if you learn nothing else, and you learn nothing else, right, from this presentation, step zero, right? Remember, <laughs> update your resume. All right. Right. So hacking, it's all about code. Maybe you're not going to believe this, but it's all about the code. There's something in a code that someone can hack. Right. And um, yes, we like to think that the artificial intelligence and um, Various programs save you. It's a human talent and engineering at the end, right? Remember the Terminator? Like Arnie punched him in the face and he melts, right? So far, computers don't have computers. Humans have computers. So it's a combination of really good tools, good visibility, and human talent actually to also do the forensic investigations. So here is an example of uh, Java code, and I'll talk a little bit about very cool. Java tool that a certain group developed. By the way, they did not get arrested, even though around maybe 15 secret services and few military units were looking for them. All right, so they, uh, they escaped. All right, so a little bit of uh, numbers. I'm often asked, like, why we are so expensive, right? And then if you look at the numbers, if you probably like a mid sized company, uh, let's say between 1 to 15 billion, if they are hacked, you're looking between 5 to 13 million just to pay. And it might not come from your cyber insurance or general liability. It's just the reality. And it reminds me a story of one uh, CISO who uh, asked me, Andre, you're going to explain to me which piece? Your invoice. What part of the invoice you don't understand? Well, it equals pretty much the ransom I had to pay these people. Right? So the, it gets expensive if you don't do the right thing at the beginning. It might get expensive. So what kind of cyber attacks usually can you see if you do the forensic investigation? These are the uh, classification. This slide is actually from Panaman Institute. A little bit combined with uh, Secret Service attribution to Verizon data breach report. <clears throat> and if you look at the first few categories, like virus, worms, Trojan malware, web-based phishing and social engineering, that gives you an idea that probably most of the hacks are really happening when users are actually downloading or manipulating some content of the internet, right? So going to see some pictures, uh, maybe getting in an email, right? Reviewing literally some, some type of web session that's ongoing on the computer. Then the various tools can help you then look at that content. Um, that uh, is a payload and is carrying like inside of like, Word documents, PDF attachments. And I'll show you one that was used for Alien Spain malware. Literally, these guys embedded HTML in an email, like a Java code, that render if you just do the preview of the Outlook. Right? So not even opening the message. Preview would render the code and infect your computer. 
So pretty slick. So they're pretty slick uh, tools these days that someone can actually go and figure out what you do on your computer. All right. Uh, anyone heard about this tool? Around three years ago. The main reason why I brought it up, the tool is that it came out of the Iranian forum. And we had multiple clients. And when this tool, when it was not released, we tried to fingerprint it. Right, so what we do in forensic too, we try to fingerprint the tool someone is using. Then at some point, someone took the code and compiled a binary for Windows of this tool. And that's how we named it. But for maybe half a year, we see, we've seen very good group performing SQL injection around the world. In the United States, we had few clients we've been breached. So we tried to fingerprint it. We knew, it's, we knew the tool. We knew the footprint. And around half a year later, someone actually released the tool to, to the public. So you might want to look into it. So partially also what we do is, is attribution. Right? So we try to figure out what is the level of sophistication. This one particularly had sometimes some intelligence agency in that region. So they were using it at some point, got discovered, the code got discovered, so they literally dumped the code to the public and someone compiled it. All right? Another interesting one that you often can see in an APT type of attacks is a code from this tool. What this tool does, uh, literally takes whatever you have in a memory, in a RAM, pulls the hashes, plain text, and then uh, you can use crackers and various programs to get it. Why do you think they do it? Because RAM is anything. On POS, point of sale systems, RAM is everything. Tokenization, everything with the credit card actually happens in RAM. So if they can scrape the RAM, that's where the all data actually is, right? That, that's where you get. Um, the credit card data, like a full dump, basically been tokenized um, for the transaction. Now, the, the hacking of the POS, we had an interesting case uh, with one of the big hospitality uh, right at the end of the year. I'm not going to disclose the name because it already was in media. But the, the way these guys done it, actually, they use a send feature, pretty much like almost like an API in Windows, to shovel the tools. So they had a server, and they lateral movement was done literally through the native commands of the Windows. Not the command prompt, not anything. Like, you know, like you have this send to feature that none of us is using. That's what they use actually distribute around the computer. So it's pretty slick. And part of it was a code actually from this tool. So for example, when we do the forensic investigation, we want to know what tools are used so then we can kind of try to match it too. Because if they compile the code and there is no signature for it, it's obfuscated. If I have a suspicion that, for example, Someone is using RAM scraper. I'll take like maybe ten tools and look for unallocated space to see if that tools was used, right? And and that gives me kind of idea of the structure, and then I know. Often we don't find much on the computers in the first place, and I'll get into that. All right, so life cycle. I'll tell everyone that you don't have to get paranoid. You just need to know who can help you. So imagine you have a police station, and they do a very good job. But they no need to have a SWAT team, right? That's being called when something really happens. So think of us, what we do is literally being that SWAT team when we are called when something actually happens. So your individuals, your security professionals at the company are actually good guys. Right? You don't have to go back and ask someone like me, are we really good? Are we good people? Should we hire a new talent? No, right? There's a different usage for corporate security, and this is very specialized in what you do. And these guys are very good. They're literally, they're like a snipers. Whenever they load the bullet, they kill you. And every shot they do, they kill you. Right? So there's not much of a recon at the beginning. They load the bullet, they kill you. Load the bullet, they kill you. Different mentality. Maybe previously you've seen a lot, a lot of recon, not anymore. And it's, a lot of recon is passive. So they study you almost like your digital footprint, who you are in your organization. I'll give you an example. There was a big company financial in New York. Their firewalls got breached. Their firewalls right, were breached. The way they done it was the guy at the DR, when they had a DR, this big financial company, posted the code from a firewall because he needed help on internet. Cisco firewall, right? And he posted configuration. You know what's in the configuration? A password. <laughs> right? Sure, it's a, MD5. Yeah, it was, it was, right? It was, it was a hash, but still. Tells you who the company is, tells you the domain, tells you the hash. You want to sign into the firewall? Well, sure you want to sign into the firewall. So the, the intelligence that we create, 
think who you are right today, most likely your digital intelligence and your digital personality is more prevalent than your physical personality. But people know you from the internet, but they don't know you from a real life. And if someone wants to cry and make you cry, literally, if he takes you for a ride on digital world and he cuts you off, you're not going to have a banking, you're not going to have a cell phone, and your credit is really ruined. We had this individual in New York here, uh, quite famous uh, guy, billionaire, that he's, uh, also sold the entertainment company. And uh, unfortunately, he has a really bad credit. But his identity was stolen. And he got better credit. Because the, actually, the thief that stole his identity had better credit. <laughs> so we're helping this guy try to get rid of the bad guy. And then he's asking us, are you really helping me? Why? Because when you guys clean me up, my credit is bad. Right? So it, it gets you in perspective. So digital world, I would say, who you create and um, how, you, how, you present, how you present yourself on internet is maybe more important than who you really are. Really, only a few friends know you, but digital world, almost everyone knows you. The same for the company. You create a footprint, you're out there. It's almost like the emission from a world when we started uh, broadcast TV and a radio, right? Aliens know we are here, right? They're coming. All right, <clears throat> so let's get into the forensic. So when we have a case, we, one of the first questions we have is like, who are really these people? A little bit of attribution. Because we had a group out of Ukraine that what they've done is they usually hack the company, they stole the data. Then they sent a few emails to company and asked for money and told them that they're going to stop the payroll because they encrypted something in the payroll. And at the end, they encrypted a few computers and asked for more money. So if you know that that's what they do, Often you're asked, so are you going to get rid of these guys? And, you, and the answer is no. Right? And why? Because let me tell you, we know the group. We already have seen them before, and this is what they do. And the day you see like a large exfiltration of the data from your network, it's the last day you heard about these people stealing anything from your network. That's the last day, right? Going forward, it's just going to be a brutal game of, you're going to pay me, you're going to give me money, here is the account. It was the last day you actually observed anything that was suspicious. From, from that group. And you didn't know for a year that they actually been inside. The information that we process is uh, quite static. So we still look at the computers, but it's much, much harder to find something, for example, on a Mac or a Windows. Like the artifacts are literally not there. Imagine the group literally flips the bit, and that triggers the fragmentation of the computer and the reboot. It's a one bit. And it happens multiple times. What are you going to find on the computer? Not much, right? It's going to re-optimize all the files. And then I can tell you, you had a solitaire game that's 10 times larger, but I don't know where the executable is. I can only tell you it's been ran. And it's called all 700 libraries as a game on your computer. So I have one fingerprint, right? I need 10 to convict you for a murder, but I have one. And it's only speculation, because I can only tell you all what I know from one artifact is you have a game that's 10 times bigger. It's a game, executable as a game. Right, game, and call these 700 libraries, crypto libraries, all kinds of libraries on computer. Nothing else. I don't have anything for you. So very important is to tap into the flow. Know what's outside of the organization. Know what's on the disk and what knows uh, what is in the flow uh, itself. We often use the tools basically to tap the traffic, but it's sometimes too little too late. Give an example. You see the traffic going back and forth to the site, and you see the, you know, the PNG picture being transmitted back and forth. 100K comes in, 5 meg leaves in the same handshake. Right? And you see that back and forth, back and forth. And it happens every day. So motion is very, very critical. <clears throat> um, what's your IR toolkit? M many ask like, how the incident response industry evolved. So the toolkit today literally is that you bring a lot of servers, a lot of different products to the site, to the client site. It's not anymore, it's not just the NKs anymore. It's literally you bring servers with various partners technology to a, to a site. And you can imagine you're almost like that orthopedic surgeon. You can be the best surgeon, you can have the best hands, but you really need to have a good toolkit. So you have to work with a lot of partners. So we have maybe around 25 partners actually, and we use their equipment and their hardware when there is an emergency. <coughs> And by the way, I didn't lose the voice to drinking with the time. It's just the weather haven't been good. Right. So how the life cycle actually looks like in APT? There's a little bit of the connection, like a classical connections. 
And you often see almost like a decoy, like these guys, they like to test you. So they start APT, and on the other hand, they run Nmap or some commands. Almost like they want to shift your direction. Or they do a little bit of a DDoS. They do a little bit something on the side to basically move the traffic. We had a client like maybe three years ago, four years ago, and they were asking us, should we block these IP addresses? And we said, it's your discretion. You tell us what you want to block. I said, no, we want to block these IP addresses. And I said, well, if we, we don't have everything. So what the guys actually did, they ran like a few tools, and then they took half of the network down. They basically flooded the network. So that day, whole IT department was not available. And no one for a week could work with us. No one for a week, literally, imagine. You take the network down. Now, after a week, everyone went to back and started to go into the data, going to the flow, and they realized that the data from two servers, almost like a whole, I would call, almost like a tear of the data was sucked up in that whole mess. So we're very careful. So usually when someone tells me, oh, it's obvious, it's Nmap, you always have to look somewhere else. It means that that's not what you'd be looking at. You're not looking at Nmap. These guys know Nmap too, believe me. They know the Nmap and all the switches too. They, they tried them before, when they were maybe 15. Um, quite important is understanding how to correlate the flow, and especially web traffic. So I would say almost 50 to 60% of the incidents that we do, we actually have to correlate web traffic in a certain way. I'll give you an example. You have a web server, right? And you see UDP traffic coming in and TCP connection going out. What do you think happened with that web server? I'll tell you exactly. Look at the UDP slammer. That's exactly what happened. You have a payload in UDP, comes in, and then establish the TCP session out. Normal program, not going to give you any correlation because there is no correlation between the UDP connectionless traffic to TCP reverse session from that system. You have to put it together. And then second question me to, would be, like, why do you allow SYN session out from your DMZ, right? Is it really important for you? Because if it's not, then cut it off completely. All right. All right. So some of the tools in the network forensic space um, that I suggest you take a look at it, these are open source projects. So for example, TCP extract is a tool that you can customize, you can extract like a JPEG or any type of what we do, for example, in a file carving that you, that you carve based on a signature and a strings, you can literally carve TCP dump data and pull something that, that's meaningful to you. Very good tool that we use quite a bit is a chaos reader. It's like maybe two pages per script, but you can customize for APT. So when you look for the connections, like this magic string, like HTTP, and it looks like a lot of gibberish and string and string and string, this usually has activation code, for example, for that APT that you're dealing with. The chaos reader can be very quickly reprogrammed to actually detect that pattern, almost like a lexical search, and then go and process the data for you. Very good tool. Um, tracing the session like a TCP trace. The wireless is not different, right? As long as it's an Ethernet-based traffic, you're dealing with the same thing. You're analyzing basically the same, same type of data. <clears throat> and XSplit was a little bit graphical. Uh, any of you familiar with the beef exploitation framework, right? Right. It's pretty, pretty good. It's good to have understanding. Like one of the maybe qualities of good incident responder is that you need to also hack. So you need to be either a hacker or you need to have some background in hacking. Because if you don't have it, you often don't know what you're looking at. You just don't know. And for example, I'm not that good at in completely in coding. I'm not going to lie. But we have two guys who are really good web developers and also do web application testing. And when there is a hack, and literally those two guys are called as well. Because we do the classical type of the forensic, but when it really comes to look, heavy something look at the code, and often it is heavy something look at the code, then you need someone who has the talent, right? who has the web application security background, and uh, also done some forensic. <clears throat> and I'll get to you uh, the um, example here in a, in a second. All right, so any of you heard about Alien Spy malware? A little bit? So this group was very interesting and uh, hit Wall Street around three years ago. Now, what they realized is that they developed this perfect phishing solution. Very, very clever phishing solution. And uh, since they put a lot of work into it, they decided that someone else should use it too. So they provided hacking as a service solution. So after one year, they literally created a uh, 
platform. There's actually a YouTube video. Uh, not gonna play, but you can actually play the YouTube video um, that provided help the services, how to install it, how to configure. They show you how to focus on a target and how to uh, basically get the target incentive um, to open your attachments. An example was an executive at one of the national banks who was part of the hiking club. And uh, he had a Hotmail account, and he probably asked the uh, individual in cybersecurity to allow from that Hotmail account uh, pictures being transferred back and forth. That's the only explanation. So they were exchanging this picture about the hiking. So attackers figure out he has his Hotmail account. They took over his Hotmail account, and they sent to all other people from other banks beautiful pictures from a hiking. And uh, some of them replied back, hey, you sent us that yesterday. Yeah, sure, but that was not the same picture. It was a payload, right? When they opened the pictures, the computers got infected. So they, they were, this, this group was very clever like how they positioned uh, the services around the, uh, um, around the LNSPY. The plan that started around $20. So literally, you could get on a platform for around like $20. They uh, <laughs> perform more sophisticated attack if you pay them consulting fee. So if you pay them around five grand, they did everything for you. Uh, if you pay them 40, they gave you a list around between five to 10 financial institutions that if you hack them and you steal less than maybe 60, $80,000, they're gonna be quiet. Right, so they had a normal portfolio of the services. Now the infrastructure they used was a former oil uh, company who left somewhere in Africa, some data center, and thought that at some point they're gonna go there. Really beautiful fiber line, everything right there in the regular service, everything paid by the oil company, right? So infrastructure was right there. And that's what they use as a launching point. Um, they use Alitorio Fuscato. So remember the Java I was mentioning at the beginning? They literally just use the demo. I suggest you go and take a look at it. So not fooling any malware here, no detection. Zero detection, right? Obfuscate, don't encrypt, obfuscate, new world. Don't, you encrypt, everyone wants you. NSA wants you, every government wants you, right? You obfuscate, you, what's, the base, what's the most common obfuscation on the internet? Base 64. That's where you wanna be in entropy. You wanna be close to base 64. That's what your traffic has to look like, obfuscate, right? So they looked at this tool called Alitori, and they realized, wow, this is great. This is exactly good entropy for whatever you do. So they obfuscated pretty much all the code, the Java code in Alitori. And they used this the demo. Just the demo version was good enough for them to actually, that's how lazy some of these guys are. You can imagine. That, that was encapsulated, that code right there, for it to be uh, undetected? Like what was the, uh, sure. this auditory? It's obfuscation tool. So basically it obfuscates the code. So then if the scanner, like any endpoint scanner is looking for any type of signature or pattern, not gonna do anything. So executable really gets, or the load, gets unpacked in the memory of the computer. That's the whole purpose. So you have to take the memory snapshot, there's nothing gonna be on a computer. And executable is gonna be these random things that basically, only executable that you're gonna get, you have to dump the memory and pull the executable or DLL. It was a DLL in many cases, you have to pull from the memory of the computer. And then they loaded most of the toolkits uh, into the memory of the computer. Right, so this is the interface. They made it beautiful interface, really GUI, clicking with the mouse, they translated it to the languages. Uh, very user friendly, right, for non-tech savvy people. Now imagine you are a law enforcement guy and you come to this organization <clears throat> and uh, they tell you, we've been hacked. And now they came to you as, a, as, as an investigator and ask you, so what do you have? So I have this group out of the Brazil, I have this group out of the Iran, I think there are Chinese in here, there are guys from Egypt, and by the way, there are guys from Estonia too. And they're looking at you. What do you mean, like, all these groups? It's almost like, what, what people done in the past when they stole a credit card of executive in New York City? They went to a store, they bought something very expensive, like a guitar, for $6,000. Then you went to the Harlem and you throw the car out of the window. And it's this guy who picks up the car and he went to get the ATM ticket and uh, milk, just to try it, he gets arrested. Now police is interrogating him and asking where is the guitar. He has no clue what the guitar is, right? Because all what he knows is what he purchased. And now, he has to convince everyone that he did not purchase the guitar. Same here. First group gets in, or second group, really good. They find these guys who also wants to pay, right? They want money. They, they give them the data. 
and bigger losers they found at the end, those guys probably get prosecuted. So the guys who, are be, who were behind this actually completely escaped. They, uh, there was a British unit that, um, British gentleman, if you read the report, of intelligence unit who uh, decrypted the RC4. And um, I don't have the full story. Uh, you know, I also have a shorter memory. We became older. But somehow the group got dismantled. Uh, and um, they never actually got arrested. They moved to something else. So they did catch the original no. no. No, no. Those guys who created this still do something else for a living. Um, so here is. Um, uh, how the configuration looks like. So this was actually encrypted by RC4, so you couldn't see it. Uh, there was a gentleman that, uh, from a British army that around two years ago wrote this decryptor on the internet. And when we came around and started looking at this malware, we came across decryptor, and we were thinking why some British intelligence unit would be creating decryptor. So apparently these guys had some background. Before that, they've done something somewhere to someone. So they've already been chased, but they, it wasn't probably a good game, so they decided to go commercial. Now, the main target for them are companies that do ACH transactions, because ACH equals real cash. Now, also, ACH is not really a data breach, because what they do is they're pulling just the money. They don't need to know who you are. They don't steal your data. right? So if you are a financial institution, you can play a role here. And I'm not a privacy attorney, but is it really a fraud or is it hacking? What is it? Right? And they picked banks, larger banks, that had intermediary banks, let's say, in Dubai. So it's an American bank, find the intermediary, find the API, uh, find someone who is close to that API, send him the attachments, send him the Java code, little like Outlook message is going to render with the Java, infect the computer, figure out how to get into that ACH flow, insert transactions, send the transaction to Western Union, or uh, one of these uh, small shops, get $5,000 at all these shops, have a mules to go and collect $300,000 in two hours. Done. Put the cash in a, in a plastic bag, go home. So basically, they usually hit like twice, twice a month. They hit the system twice a month, either API or ACH transaction center. They knew exactly. They went to someone who they knew that in two, three weeks, the statement's going to reconcile and they're not going to match up. Right? Because no one really at these micro payments like your Google wallet for $50, $60 actually sends you any money. It's only reconciliation. And they knew by the time it's going to get into America, they're off the hook. Money paid, it's all real cash. Right, so uh, that's, that's a video on, uh, on the uh, Alan Spine in action uh, on uh, YouTube. So if you're interested in, just Google uh, uh, the, uh, the link. Okay. <clears throat> So main point here was that when we started working, everyone was asking, so how come our endpoint security is not effective? Very simple, obfuscation. Very simple trick gets you out of the any endpoint protection. So back to what I said before, why flow analytics is important. Because if you have, think about this, I'm from uh, Eastern Europe, right? So uh, what do you think happens to your bag when you leave bag in Eastern Europe? <laughs> Disappears, right? What do you think happens when you leave a bag in Israel? I was just in tech forum. The squad's going to come and they're going to blow it up. They're going to detonate it, right? So ultimately, what you need is kind of device like a cipher of one of these vendors who detonates high level of paranoia, detonates any container that could carry the malware. That would actually show you that there is obfuscation in that payload, in that picture, in the document. That's a higher level of paranoia, right? So we do that in our office. So please send us stuff, because we love the detonation. So parallel. Now, it's parallel, which means that you, you're not going to stop it at that point. You, but it's around five minutes for you to realize you have it, that someone is chasing you. Now, one of the things that I tried to explain <clears throat> one of the CEOs is that, please don't send me an email. And he got offended. And, uh, and he was asking me, why? Why should I not send you an email? And I tried to very nicely tell him that his network being owned by some people who are reading his emails. Because then the next three days, whole our firm got all these emails. Pictures, PDF, and attachments. And believe me, some of these people are not really nice people. Hmm. They used to work for intelligence agencies. Then we had a guy, that one guy that they chased, had a whole wall on AK-47. 
and, and uh, models and motives and where he shoots and what he does. I don't think he's a really nice guy. I think if he knew I'm working on his case and he gets arrested and he gets out of the jail, I might be on that wall too with my small picture, right? And with a cross sign. So it's very hard to tell these executives that if they don't have a plan B and they don't have a plan B, right, because they don't never have a parallel system, <laughs> then don't, don't try to engage us in a way when you start sending emails. Legal contracts. These guys are reading you. I don't want my race being on the internet on my contracts. The better story was uh, from uh, maybe two months ago. There was an entity in, uh, in the US that had uh, some health records stolen. And um, the attackers also encrypted the system. And the uh, entity decided not to disclose. It's like hypothetical. I only heard about rumor from the internet. I don't know much about this. But I heard it's a rumor, right, hypothetically. And uh, um, so then the attackers really were depressed that these guys are not paying them after three days. So what they did actually, they I, hypothetically went to a law enforcement agency and sent them a memo that they hacked this company, they have their data, and it's a uh, healthcare data, and this company literally didn't disclose the breach. <laughs> <laughs> right? And they sent a mail back to CEO and said, listen, we're going to go more higher if you don't pay us. We are real about this. And they even wrote the statement from, I think, like SEC, fiduciary duty, director and officer liability to safeguard the data <laughs> equals criminal. <laughs> right? So these guys are not joke anymore. They know exactly what they do. They study law. They're not kids. If you don't pay them, they know what to do with you, too. So you have to pick your battles. Like, it used to be that I'm not, I don't want to talk to law enforcement. Like, I, I'm not going to talk to Scott or Leo or from Secret Service or from FBI. Now you have to. Pretty much you have five, six hours of then one day to make the decision. Because tomorrow, it's tomorrow, it's 24 hours after the breach. Did you disclose it? What do you really know? So you kind of have to make that friendly call and say, what do you have? Not really sure. I'm looking into it. OK, cool. At least they need to know. One of the things that I've seen, uh, and I see in America and in Europe, is <clears throat> when companies breach, and law enforcement comes in, one of the things they do is, and many companies are surprised, they start looking at the financial statements. And they look at the financial statements, what you spend on CapEx, what you spend on OPEX, and what type of third party assessment you've done. They literally study you, like how you really care about security. Think about this. They thinking, in my mind, they're really thinking, should we really arrest these guys for negligence, or should we help them? Because it's almost like me operating an airplane, and I know I need 40 million to buy a plane and 5 million to maybe pay the cost for to operate, but I decide to one day that I'm going to spend two. And I'm inviting all of you to fly in. What do you think is going to happen to the plane? At some point, the story might not be that great, right? We, we all might be swimming in the ocean among the sharks and cold water. <clears throat> now, the, in the LS spy malware, the, the group, when too many people started chasing them, um, ultimately there was an agency who took down the whole infrastructure out of the country in Africa. And then they decided that that was enough for them. Basically, I mean, we, we, had, we made a cash for almost like a three and a half years. Let's do something else. One of the members was a very interesting guy. Um, I mean, we didn't know his identity, but he was definitely a former intelligence officer. Just the way he, he had access to the, to the code and the tools, you could tell there was a really good craftsmanship in his work. Like, he literally published the code with such a pride that I wish all the security vendors could go and post their code on the internet with as pride as he did. All right. This is a little bit of the process. So when they had a dropper, then they basically created the file, created the process, and terminated the processes. So the challenge here was that the process very quickly escaped the memory. If there was nothing to do, like in five seconds, 10 seconds, it will escape the memory. So imagine the imaging memory is not an easy task, meaning that you have to have an agent already if we want to grab it. And now anything after the fact is almost like a carving. You're looking for some remnants into it. So literally, you need to have what I, what I would call like a Dracula effect, like a fresh blood. 
And when you have that fresh blood, then you can pull the memory image from it and start analyzing the, the dropper and the tools. Now, they created in a way that they, they had, I don't know, like 40 or 50 different loads. So you never had everything. So you never had a whole picture. All right. This is a little, little bit on a, on a forensic piece. So for example, this is one of the uh, executables. That's how you look in the prefetch analysis. This is obfuscating the jar file. Um, they also, when you look at in here, this computer was hacked, but are on four groups at the same time. So some of them did obfuscate it, some of them didn't obfuscate it. But all of them used the same platform, that alien spy malware platform, to launch the attack and basically uh, penetrate the system. <coughs> we submitted some of these uh, malware to, uh, to antivirus vendors and started to classify them. The main reason why we've done it, because when we started sandboxing, we wanted to speed up the process, right? So literally, uh, when we when we had a signature for it from a memory, we gave it to vendors, we gave it for a detonation, and uh, uh, we started pulling it from it. <clears throat> this is, for example, example what I mentioned before, when they ran the defragmentation on a computer. So you can actually see the defragmentation being ran on the computer and Dr. Watson. Right? So they created this file, like um, errors, that dump through the disk, and then they defragment the computers. So they basically, they created errors to fill the space and defragment the computer. Everything in Windows tools. One bit, flipping one bit. They have a beautiful work. Right, here are some of the obfuscated files. Uh, that's how the structure, for example, look like. This is the original, like a jar file that they've sent. Look at the location, right? So it's coming from the user temporary folder. If you disable through that to the GPO in your Active Directory, right, then you will be probably safe here. But they figure out that very quickly, too. Okay. This is a little, little bit of the, from a memory, how the memory dumps actually look like, um, and the code as affiliated with it, um, and some of the calls to, um, to the victims. All right. All right, so when you breach, what's next? <clears throat> what is next? <laughs> Perfect. If you learn nothing else, and we learn nothing else today, right? When you are breached, just don't panic. <laughs> Get a glass of water. Go to your computer and update your resume. It's been three years, four years since you got this job. You've done a lot of good things. <laughs> you have to be proud of yourself, right? Update your resume. Now, it's, seriously, it's the major challenge uh, in forensic is that uh, we're working with this financial uh, bank, and they tell us that we have this center, and they're 24-7. We are ready for this. And then you're looking at the experience of the people from like maybe all 40 people, seven individuals really lived in this war zone experience, which means you have seven leads that can actually tell the other folks what to do. So when you are in this business, what do you think the Army does? Training, training. You constantly have to train. So the, the way we are trained is that we process these cases. But at a company, you constantly have to do the training of your people. Because then, then the team is not really effective. Any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>